I want you to hit me as hard as you can. You can't deny that Battlestar Galactica is a show that has had a huge impact on the direction of science fiction on television through its four seasons on the Sci-Fi Channel. It was beautifully written, with compelling characters, conspiracies, and shocking revelations. Even the action was amazing, with firefights that were just as intense as the Star Wars films. This show had a huge impact on my life, where I began to think of TV not as just entertainment, but also as an art form. However, I have had an interesting view of this show as it went along. In the beginning, I thought this show was amazing, only to feel let down by the series finale five years later. But that's what was great about this show. It sparks debates between its fans. It's one of those shows like Lost that sparks passion in the viewers' hearts, which leads to friendships and discovering other equally incredible shows. Even after the series ended, its mythology continues on today with prequels, action figures, comics, and all sorts of methods to keep the world of BSG alive. But many fans of Battlestar don't know that the war between the Cylons and the humans actually began 26 years earlier on ABC. Yes, the show that led to such a massive popularity with TV viewers in the early 2000s was originally struggling to stay alive in its original incarnation, which aired from 1978 to 1979. If it wasn't for the dedicated fans, this franchise would have fallen into obscurity, forgotten in TV purgatory. So today, we will examine how the bones of the original Battlestar Galactica evolved into the massive franchise as it is today. We will see how a show that was kept alive by the passion of fans has now transferred into a new generation of dedicated viewers. But was the original series that important to this modern behemoth of sci-fi, or am I just exaggerating? Well, let us find out in this installment of Gone, but not forgotten. Battlestar Galactica first aired on September 17, 1978 on ABC. It was created by Glenn A. Larson, the same man who would create Knight Rider, Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, and co-created Magnum P.I. Larson claimed that he first created Battlestar Galactica back in the 1960s, where he originally named it Adam's Ark. The original concept for the show revolved around a billionaire who tricks the best scientists, warriors, and thinkers onto a ship that takes off into space to avoid some sort of apocalyptic event. And many who have examined this show say that it actually serves as an allegory for Mormonism. And Larson was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so that may track. If you examine it, there certainly are some similarities. But while Larson later admitted that there was a kernel of truth to this, he said that it was actually far more inspired by Egyptian mythology, with many theological concepts mixed into the show. Still, many criticized that Battlestar Galactica was merely a blatant ripoff of Star Wars. But I for one just can't see it. I mean, come on, just show me one time where they ripped off Star Wars. <laughs> Okay, fine, it's Star Wars. But even though there is a lot of Star Wars injected into the show, the original concept is still very unique. That the human race is unaware of an intergalactic civilization out there from which we all originally hail, which is searching for us humans and who are themselves fleeing from a monstrous enemy. There is a case for this show plagiarizing Star Wars, but maybe the truth is somewhere in between. Maybe even though the concept of Battlestar was unique, it was the studio that forced it to resemble that blockbuster film. But I guess we'll never really know the true answer. What we do know is that Universal got their butt sued off by 20th Century Fox for plagiarism and copyright infringement. This lawsuit went on for years, finally coming to an end in the mid-80s without going to trial. 
George Lucas himself was not happy either, as he threatened legal action against the video effects company that provided the special effects for Battlestar Galactica. The company's artist used to work for Lucas, and he claimed they used his equipment without his permission. But the main thing Lucas went after was Battlestar Galactica's merchandise. He was concerned that the toys were a choking hazard that would be dangerous to children, and did not want to get blamed for any injuries. Sadly, Lucas was correct. The Battlestar toys were not well designed. They included pellets that were a choking hazard, and children would suffer injuries, with an incident that tragically led to a four-year-old dying from choking on a pellet. Still, the three-hour pilot for this series proved to be very popular, so much so that it was aired theatrically in Canada and overseas. So let us begin by examining the pilot, shall we? A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away... Um... I mean, an undetermined time in a special star system, a very long distance away, the human race from the 12 colonies of the universe has been warring against the evil Cylons, a race of robots that were created by an ancient race of lizard people, also called Cylons, who were wiped out by their creations. The Cylons have been at war with the humans for a thousand years after the humans intervened in their conquering of a peaceful race of aliens called the Hasaris. In the pilot, the humans and the Cylons are conducting peace negotiations, hoping to end the brutal war that has only brought death and destruction to both of their races. Two of the best human pilots of the human fleet, Starbuck and Apollo, are ordered on a routine patrol in Cylon territory, where Apollo's brother Zack begs to take Starbuck's place. Yeah, he's dead. Don't believe me? Well, let us go over the tragic death checklist in sci-fi movies. Number one, the rookie pilot begs to take the place of a more experienced pilot. Number two, it's just a routine expedition in enemy territory. Number three, the rookie is the sibling of the main character. And finally, the character has a normal name while everyone else has exotic names. But hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just being paranoid. <laughs> yep, didn't see that coming. The Cylons are discovered to have assembled a fleet of ships to attack the humans by surprise. Commander Adama begs the president to let him go defend the colonies from the Cylon attack. But the president instead listens to his advisor and negotiator with the Cylons, named Count Baltar, who warns the president that the peace talks will break down if he listens to the unverified warnings from Adama. So the colonies are left undefended, the remaining battle stars are destroyed, and the president is assassinated. Mr. President, your welcoming committee is firing at our patrol. Baltar? Baltar? Peace out, bitches. The Cylons destroy the colonies, and Adama gathers the remaining ships to take in the handful of survivors and run from the Cylons. Adama then begins their journey to Earth, the lost 13th tribe, to save what is left of humanity. The rest of the pilot episode revolves around facing issues that were not featured in science fiction stories at the time trying to navigate the political class warfare, avoiding starvation, and keeping anarchy from infecting the survivors. It's funny because nowadays these topics are also heavily featured in Bong Joon-ho's popular sci-fi flick, Snowpiercer, as well as its spin-off TV series on TNT. By the way, that is a good show. I recommend you viewers check it out. Anyway, we are introduced to many main and recurring characters in the series. Of course, we've got our leader, Commander Adama, played by Lorne Green. Larson said that he sought Green out for the part because of his role as the patriarch Ben Cartwright on the hit TV western Bonanza, with Larson saying that Battlestar Galactica practically served as an Old West wagon train, a set of ships strung together to seek a new land of prosperity. Adama had a deep faith that the ancient prophecies would lead him and his people to Earth. He was also very savvy, 
as he was able to navigate the politics and agenda from the new Council of Twelve. Plus, he was a brilliant tactician who was always two steps ahead of the Cylons. But he was also welcoming of ideas from Apollo and Starbuck. Secondly, we have Colonel Ty, played by Terry Carter. Carter had a long career in stage and TV before Battlestar came around, and even went on to become the world's very first black news anchor. I liked Ty. He was very stern, but wise. He was hard on the crew, but only because he wanted to prepare them for the toll that war would take on them. For example, he lets the crew throw a party for Apollo when... Oh wow, is that Ed Begley Jr.? It is! It is baby Ed Begley Jr. playing a pilot! What's his name? I bet it's something cool like Star Killer or Cylon Destroyer. Um, yeah. Not gonna lie, Begley, the name Green Bean would not inspire fear from your enemies. Hunger? Yes. But fear? Uh, probably not. Next up, we have the two best pilots in the fleet, Apollo and Starbuck. Apollo was played by Richard Hatch, a stage actor who went on to have a decent career on television. He even became heavily involved in the franchise after the show was gone, writing several novels based off of Battlestar. Apollo happens to be the firstborn son of Adama, and I guess that you could say he was a lot like Captain Malcolm or Mal Reynolds from Firefly but not as bitter as Reynolds could sometimes be on that show. He's a real badass, who often comes up with ingenious plans against the Cylons, leading to them serving crippling blows to their forces. He quickly falls in love with Serena, a reporter and widowed single mother. Her son, Boxy, was played by Noah Hathaway, who would go on to have an amazing career, later playing Atreyu in The NeverEnding Story, and teaching dance for many years in his adulthood until an injury forced him to find a new career designing custom motorcycles. As for Serena, she was played by the amazing Jane Seymour, who most of you know as Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. Out of all the cast, Seymour was the breakout star of the show, who would go on to have an extensive career in TV and film and she marries Apollo fairly quickly in the series, which means that she is soon going to die. I mean, come on, guys. You all know that 97% of all marriages in science fiction result in death, and you can tell a character's destined to die from these telltale signs. Number one, the character is the love interest of the lead or a popular character on the show. Number two, they marry relatively quickly. Number three, they don't do much other than give moral support to the character on the series. And number four, they're so lovable that no one has any negative feelings towards them. And so Serena gets offed in the episode where she marries Apollo, as Jane Seymour was not interested in the producer's offer to become a series regular. Her son Boxy, on the other hand, goes on to become the adoptive son of Apollo. He also gets a new pet to replace his dog who died in the Cylon attack of the colonies, with a robotic dog he calls Muffet 2, which looks like... <laughs> One of the stupidest things I have ever seen on TV. And the actor who played Muffet 2 was not a human being but rather a chimpanzee named Evie. Poor Evie the chimp. Not only does she look silly in this costume, but it had to have been horribly uncomfortable for her to wear. Although they did replace Evie with what was pretty much a robotic dog puppet for the long takes which did not require movement. Now Starbuck was the Han Solo of the bunch, as he was a womanizing scoundrel. He was played by Dirk Benedict who was cast by Larson because he felt that Benedict had sex appeal, as well as being a good actor. Fun fact for you, they almost cast Don Johnson as Starbuck, before he of course went on to star in Miami Vice instead. Starbuck had many love interests on the show, primarily Athena, the sister of Apollo, and Cassiopeia, a former social leader who would eventually become a medical assistant. Many of the episodes which featured Starbuck would usually focus on his romantic subplots 
and a heaping dose of sci-fi action. Finally, we've got Boomer, played by Herbert Jefferson Jr., who was the straight man next to Starbucks Insanity. He was calm, perceptive, and incredibly smart, and seemed to be a jack of all trades, as he was a seasoned pilot, a communications expert, and also knew a second language. Now on to the main villain of the show, Count Baltar, played by John Kalikos. Kalikos also happened to play a vital role in Star Trek as Kor, the first Klingon ever seen on the original series. He would also play this character again in one of my favorite episodes of Deep Space Nine. Baltar was the man who would cause the genocide of his fellow humans, and his character reminded me a lot of Dr. Smith from Lost in Space, a sniveling opportunist who would change his motivations at the drop of a hat for his well-being, and would serve as a thorn in everyone's side. The show's plots featured a lot of the standard space adventure tropes such as aliens and star fights, but I personally enjoyed the episodes that focused on either the search for Earth or life on the ship. For example, the two-part episode Lost Planet of the Gods focuses on an infection that incapacitates practically all of the Galactica's pilots, forcing them to train women, who on the show are seen as not fit to fly. Watching these female pilots excel is quite satisfying from an audience standpoint, along with the discovery of an ancient chamber that points the way to Earth, which leads to a shocking ending. Unfortunately, the original Battlestar Galactica series was cancelled by ABC after only one season, as the ratings did not support the money spent on special effects, props, and other aspects of a science fiction show of such great magnitude. And in my opinion, I think that tracks out, and I'm sure the lawsuits they were fighting didn't help either. Not to mention the bad press they must have been dealing with after the death and injuries caused by their merchandise. However, thanks to fan outcry and a letter writing campaign, the show would be brought back by the network. Sort of. You see, at the time, Glenn Larson and producer Donald Belisario had to pitch a new show that would not be as expensive as the first show. So they came up with the idea that years after the original series, the Galactica would arrive on present day Earth, leading to the events of Galactica 1980. Since Dirk Benedict was not available and Hatch turned down the new show, a grown-up Boxy and his best friend Dylan would serve as the new stars of the show. The premise for the pilot episode would revolve around the two main characters going down to Earth at the orders of Baby John Lennon, or rather Dr. Z, a super intelligent 10-year-old. Along their journey, they would meet a plucky reporter, and by plucky I mean annoying, and seek out a professor to help him develop technology for the benefit of mankind. Boxy and Dylan's original plan was to help the human race develop quicker, so that they would be ready when the Cylons inevitably arrived. However, a member of the Council of Twelve named Commander Xavier decides to steal a time ship so that he can change the past and help the human race become even more advanced. So the show was now a time travel series. But then the network changed their minds and started to interfere with the concept of the show. They ordered Larson and Belisario to drop the time travel aspect and now have the main characters training a group of children from the Galactica who happen to have superhuman strength due to Earth's atmosphere. Which is just a natural progression of the series. Not only that, but the network insisted they feature some kind of educational content on the show. Fans hated it, and I don't blame them, because this show sucked. Oh lord, did it suck. Galactica 1980 is Battlestar Galactica in name only. If you took out the character names and started it without referencing the previous series, it would still be a show about time travel and superhuman children. The episodes were also very badly written. There was a lot of fish-out-of-water comedy, which got old fast. So thanks to the bad comedy, a bad budget, and being put on a time slot that competed with 60 minutes, the second incarnation of the show was cancelled after 10 episodes. 
ending on a cliffhanger. Quite frankly, I would skip Galactica 1980 and pretend it never happened. And that is exactly what Richard Hatch did in 1999, when he remortgaged his house to fund a pilot for a sequel to Battlestar Galactica that promised to lead into an action-packed series. In this pilot, Apollo was now the commander of the fleet and led a new band of pilots against the Cylons, one of whom happened to be Starbuck's daughter. The 30-minute pilot has never been seen publicly, but there is a trailer of it online, and although many fans loved it, Universal did not bite. Instead, the go-ahead was given for a reimagining of the franchise, which kicked off with a miniseries in 2004, and the success of that miniseries would lead to a regular series that lasted four seasons and two spin-offs. The first of the spin-offs, Caprica, would only last one season, and the second, Blood and Chrome, was a web series that led to the production of a failed TV pilot. Caprica was a prequel that chronicled the creation of the Cylons, while Blood and Chrome chronicled the adventures of the young Commander Adama during the Cylon War. I recently saw Blood and Chrome, and I gotta say, it was pretty good. It's too bad sci-fi passed on the pilot, because the resulting TV show would have been another great addition to the Battlestar Galactica legacy. Now at this point in the episode, we ask, as always, should this show come back? Well, my answer is no, since the 2000s Battlestar pretty much covered it, with debatable results in quality. But believe it or not, there are plans on rebooting this series yet again. Brian Singer was attached at one point to make a Battlestar film, but as of this episode, Simon Kinberg, the writer behind the X-Men film universe and the Robert Downey Sherlock Holmes movies, is planning on writing and producing a Battlestar Galactica film, along with co-producer Dylan Clark. To which I say... STOP IT! <laughs> Honestly, do we need another reboot of the show? Sure, I wasn't happy with the ending of the last series, but it mostly gave the fans what they wanted. It's too soon for a new Battlestar Galactica. Give it another 10 years to marinate. But if any of you out there are curious and want to watch the original series, you can now see it on the streaming service, Tubi. But no matter what series you prefer, whether it's the original Star Wars clone, the time-traveling Super Kids, or the version where the Cylons were hot blondes, I think you will agree with me that the Galactica has finally come home to rest. I see you flying round space with that car I love, and I'm like, frack you. I guess saving you from Lil Ben wasn't enough. I'm like, frack him, ma'am. You too, I said if I were a down I'd still be with ya Ha, now ain't that some shit And though the guys won't listen I still wish you the best with the Frack you I'm Jesse Shade speaking on behalf of David Arroyo for JoeBlow.com And thank you for watching our show If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel Tell all your friends who like the sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all of your support. And we will see you next time for the next installment of Gone But Not Forgotten.